are being tormented and probably carry on being tormented. Didn't know any different really because of where we lived, it was normal. In Rotherham, hundreds of young girls have their lives torn apart. Failed by the police, by social services, failed by men who abused them. Some were brought to justice, but the scourge of grooming continues. Nearly half of current child sexual exploitation cases being pursued by South Yorkshire police are rooted in Rotherham. There has been progress, though, with 21 convictions over the last three years. For those victims brave enough to speak out in court, the law protects them with lifetime anonymity. Some, though, have decided to go further. Best friends Lindsay and Natalie tonight speaking on camera for the first time. Lindsay was 15 when she was abused by Arshid, Ash Hussein. Arshid's brother, Banaras, Bono Hussein, raped Natalie when she was just 13. Both were given lengthy jail sentences. What happened that first time that you met him? He was just trying to get on top of me. He was trying to pull my trousers down um, on the settee in front of everybody. Um, but I like, pushed him away and I think it's because everyone would be there. I could get away. The following day, next day, my friend took me to his house and um, left me with him in the bedroom. And that's when the first time he cost us raped me because I couldn't get out there and he wouldn't let me out and he was putting fear into me and I just couldn't get out of the room. I mean, it must have been absolutely terrifying. Yeah, it was. I went home and got, I remember getting straight in the bath and scrubbing myself. Mm -hmm. But you were sort of thinking that this was like a normal boyfriend-girlfriend situation. Yeah, because I'd never been in a relationship really before. I'd had been out with people and said, oh, this is my boyfriend, but that's it. I'd never had a relationship. What did your parents think? My parents didn't know at first. And when I got pregnant, I didn't tell them. I kept it a secret for like three months. It was only afterwards that they knew. And having to end the pregnancy, what kind of toll did that take on you? It was torture because I couldn't tell anybody were pregnant because they were older, like no, no adults. I think I told a couple of friends, but one minute I was wanting to keep it because I wanted, well, in my head I thought, oh, he's going to be with me and everything's going to be fine. Obviously it wouldn't have been. And Natalie, what impact did he have on your life? My childhood was ruined from that point and the following years was, my life has been destroyed. There's another occasion I went to where we lived. There was like a woods there and I wouldn't do a sexual act on him and he pulled my ear back and started kicking me on the floor. Um, I phoned the police then and I, I was scared and I said to him what he'd done and they said, well, you've got to press charges, we can't do anything. I goes, oh, I'm scared, I'm scared, you don't know what they're like. But I gave him a name, nothing we're done. So how does that strike you now? Yeah, disgusting. I don't know what I've had to deal with or gone through and I'm just a child <laughs> and there's all these people there that's supposed to be protecting you and they didn't. Do you think that things have changed in Rotherham or are you fearful that some of the awful abuse that you went through might still be going on? You just know that it's still happening. You see, when you're driving down town centre roads, you see the, the men in the cars and the girls and stuff. You still see that yeah. now? But if you can see that, why can't the police see that? I don't know. What is it like every day, though, living mm -hmm. with what happened to you? Um, a torment, yeah. I have to relive it and have to deal with panic attacks. And it's torment. I've been tormented and probably carry on being tormented, it's, it's really bad. <laughs> it's hard to trust anybody mm. and get close to anyone. You have attachment problems with every, it's not just relationships, it's yeah. with everybody in your life. Yeah. But it does get better. And the incredible thing is that, you know, you've been best friends from childhood. Mm. You went through hell together. Mm. You stayed best friends. And then here you are, both of you, 
still the best of friends talking about this. We've just had to support each other through it, yeah. like court. We've had it a lot easier because we, I've been able to speak to her and she fully understands, yeah. even if I can't explain myself right, yeah. she knows what I'm trying to say and how it feels and the same, yeah. vice versa. Yeah. How important is this relationship to you? Yeah, very important, yeah. yeah. <laughs> best friends. <laughs> You'll always be best friends. Ben. Yeah. yeah. Well, many survivors of sexual exploitation committed crimes while they were under the control of grooming gangs. One proposal for helping to minimise the long-term impact on them is to have their criminal records expunged. Some senior police officers are backing a change to the law to offer them pardons. And I'm joined now by Sammy Woodhouse, who was also abused in Rotherham and who is behind the campaign for a so-called Sammy's Law. And here in the studio, Vera Baird, the lead police and crime commissioner on victims. Sammy, we just heard that very powerful testimony from those two people, and many of that will be... Much of that will be familiar to you, I'm sure. But can you explain to us what sort of crimes children who were being groomed and abused were then convicted of? Um, well, I think we need to look at people as individuals and, you know, we've all got different experiences and we was all for to do different things. Um, I myself had three things on my criminal record. So, for an example, I was caught half naked in bed with him. Uh, just a few days after my 15th birthday um, and because he'd give me a truncheon to save in, in my bag I was then arrested um, he wasn't he wasn't even questioned and still today because it's classed as um, a dangerous weapon that's still on my criminal record and and what you know people need to realize is um, what you know we've come forward we've testified in court we've proved that we were um, a victim of this crime, but yet we're still being punished for it. If I was to go for a job interview, I would have to declare that, I'd have to go into my abuse. Um, and it's for us, as, as for victims and survivors, we're constantly having to battle to be able to move forward and try and have, um, you know, any kind of life, really. And I guess rather than talk about all of that, many survivors would rather just not apply for jobs, not get themselves into situations where they'll have to confront that. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, like I say, when you go to a job interview, you'd have to relive that abuse. Um, and, you know, for, for some people, it is so difficult to go through it. I mean, I've done it a lot now just because I'm a campaigner, but it's still very exhausting, it's draining, it's something, you know, I only do because I know it helps other people. Um, you know, to be able just to go to a job interview and, and want to say, well, actually, I want to get back into work, I want to provide for myself and move forward with a future, and to have to constantly just go over that all the time, it's, it's just not OK. Uh, Vera Baird, um, you've been a, a politician in Parliament as well as being a, a, a criminal um, QC. What, what are the obstacles to doing this? Um, it's obviously the right principle. Somebody's subordinated to another's will and they commit a crime when that's in the, in the, the situation. They're not doing it of their own free will. That's now recognised going forward. The modern slavery legislation, which is very new, of course, understands that principle. So do you think they wouldn't be convicted today? Uh, they, well, in that there situation? would be a defence if they'd been enslaved, not not groomed, but if they'd been enslaved or they'd been trafficked, then there is a defence that they did it because of that. If they're under 18, they don't even have to show they were compelled, they have to show that another similar person, i.e. their age and gender, would have done the same, i.e. that it was a reasonable and only response. And then they won't be prosecuted. So what seems quite wrong is that that is going forward and uh, it is only about slavery and exploitation. This is about grooming, which is just as damaging, and we have to try and look back. But to do that, I think Sammy's hit the, the nail on the head, we probably have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, and it probably needs legislation. So it can't be a blanket pardon for everybody? No, how could it be? It would be about the levels of grooming. Even the Modern Slavery Act only pardons low-level crime because of being uh, suborned. It doesn't do stuff like kidnapping and murder. And obviously, different levels of coercion are relevant to different levels of crime. You would have to show in each case, I think, what had happened, but the oh, Lord Commission could work out a way of doing this, and I think it's urgent the government's asked them to do it, because brave people like this, who've come forward, are being held back from having a good life now by the fact that when they were groomed, quite against their own will, they committed crimes. Sammy, one of the most striking things in that interview uh, with, with, with Cathy there was those women saying they still see the perpetrators. Yeah. Clear implication that it's still going on. Is that yeah, your belief? 
Yeah, um, you know, it's, it is still going on in Rotherham around the country. Some people think, oh, well, this only happens in Rotherham, and of course that's not true. It's uh, it's a major problem um, for the country, not just street grooming. Um, online grooming now is absolutely huge. Um, when it was happening to me, we didn't really have things such as Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, all the the internet thing now. So um, that's a huge problem. And we, I do think we've made um, a lot of improvements in Rotherham, definitely. I mean, you know, the court cases, um, speak for themselves and you know especially people uh, like Lindsay and Natalie coming forward um, and testifying in those and you know just by coming forward they've, they've put those people in prison and they've helped keep so many people safe they've raised awareness by that and the fact that they're you know now waving their anonymity to to help raise more awareness I think is great and yeah we, we need people like us to you know to keep speaking out because of course it is still happening we need to uh, try and, and do what we we can to make it stop. Vera Baird, I mean, you would hope the police have different attitudes today. Yeah. I, do, you, I, do you also believe it's still going on to that degree and that the police aren't noticing? I think that there are now um, accepted ways in which the police look when they get the slightest clue that such a thing is happening and pursue it. And it is people like this speaking out who've made it better nationwide. Well, not, not according just to the testimony Rotherham. we just heard, though, was it? I mean, they were saying they see these guys driving around. Well, I mean, there have just been a whole series, Operation Sanctuary, it was called, of convictions of exactly this kind in Newcastle. As soon as there was a clue it was going on, the police were in there putting a great deal of resource and effort into ensuring that they got convictions. They've had convictions and sentences of 300 and odd years altogether. Vera Baird, Sally Woodhouse, thank you both very much.